Hey, gang, we are in Kewanee, Illinois today. We're about mm, Chicago, about 150 miles that way to the east, a little to the north, but mostly east. Iowa's right over there. And we're at the cemetery here called Weathersfield. Why I'm in the car? I'm in the car because it is blowing. The wind is fierce today. Got here on this long drive and I wanna go ahead with the shoot. So I'll have to do narration in the sound booth for you and set alive as we walk. A lot of cool t uh, gravestones here and things to see, monuments. But anyway, I'm gonna be reading a letter today from one of those that were killed. This is, we're gonna go to Kansas with this story. It's going to be a Wild West story, pioneering story. Some unfortunate things happened to two young men who were pioneer settlers there. And one of the letters was literally a few days, I think six days before he was killed with his brother. And then we're gonna go on and we're gonna read a note about the incident from one of the captains from the cavalry, from the army. So we're gonna be reading anyway. So doing the sound booth, I wanna thank Lisa who visits the cemetery and found this very unique, very unique monument with their names, their mothers buried there too. They're from this area. They came from the east. We'll talk about that. But Lisa found this and, you know, there's an inscription on there, killed by the Indians and all that. So she was asking me, what what happened here? And I couldn't find much on it. But Deb, our ancestry helper, dug deep and came up with a lot of the information you're going to hear. So let's take a walk. We'll get into the wind, but it'll be quiet. And we'll do a little Wild West talk while we look at some monuments and stones and we'll end up at this really interesting monument for the Moffats. So as we walk along here among the gravestones and monuments, a couple of quick notes. In the writings that I'm going to quote, Native Americans were referred to as Indians, so don't take offense. We're reading from the articles of the time. This story is going to give you a real feel of what it was like to be a pioneer in these conditions. It's actually very similar to the Dowdy family story that I told in Texas. So let's begin. The parents, David Moffat and Elizabeth Nickel, came to America around 1840. They came from Ireland and they settled in the east around Philadelphia. Later on, they struck out to the west and they moved to Stark and then Henry County, Illinois. And it was in the 1860s that two of their sons got the itch, the itch to be explorers and pioneers. So John and Thomas, their names went west. And their story is as follows. May 30th, 1909, the story was written by C. Bernhardt. It was published in Lincoln, Kansas by the Lincoln Sentinel Print in 1910. And from one of the chapters, chapter one, entitled, Massacre of the First Settlers, 1864. The first settlers in Lincoln County, John L. Moffat, Thomas Moffat, John W. Houston, and James Tyler, were murdered by the Indians August 6, 1864. The only reliable information we have regarding the settlement here of any of these young men is derived from a letter written to members of the family by the Moffat brothers. Actually, the letter we're going to read was written by the younger brother, Thomas, to his sister. Selena, Kansas, July 30th, 1864. McCandless and Nancy, I suppose it is my time to write now as I have left home. I have no chance to hear from you through any letters that you may send others. I have not had a letter from home since I came away and I've not heard from you for a long time. You must try and write as soon as it will be convenient for I am dreadfully anxious to hear from you. I left home in the middle of April and came to Kansas. Although I don't like Kansas, I think I will stay for a while. Jack and I have bought about 50 head of cows and heifers. We are going to raise stock. 
I think we can make a living easier raising cattle than working so hard as we used to. This is an excellent grazing country and is very poor farming country. The fact is, it is too subject to drought or farming. We were doing very well and would do as well now if it weren't for the Indians. We would make five to six dollars a day hunting buffalo, but we have been obligated to give it up for the present. The Indians are so hostile to the hunters and settlers that we dare not go from the house. When we have to, we go armed. Even when we go to the stable to take care of our horses, we carry our revolvers along. Rather hard lines these from what we have been used to. The government has sent out several companies of soldiers, but they can't fight the Indians as well as settlers themselves. Some of the folk here have families. They're leaving Salina for a more safe place. Some expect there will be a regular Indian war, but I don't think there will be any trouble in the settlement from the Indians. Jack just got back the other day in the company with two other fellows, and they fetched a load of hides. As I have nothing that is interesting to tell you, I will fetch my letter to a close. Give my love to uncle and aunt and all my friends. Thomas Moffat. Now this letter from Thomas Moffat was dated July 30th, 1864. It was written just six days before his death. The two hunters spoken of in the letters were John W. Houston and one Tyler. The letter seems to convey the idea that there were several companies of soldiers sent out by the government for the purpose of protecting the settlers from the Indians. But from the sentiment of the letter, it seems as though the settlers had poor faith in that kind of protection. Now reading on, there is a section on the troops, troops of the Kansas frontier. The troops on our frontier during the Civil War were very poorly armed. Henry Booth was captain of Company L, 11th Kansas Cavalry, which was raised in the neighborhood of Fort Riley. In the summer of 1864, he was in command of a battalion on duty in the neighborhood of Salina and Lincoln counties. Second Lieutenant William Booth was in command and detachments from the 14th and 15th Kansas State Militia, numbering in all about 92 men. In a report of a scouting trip along Smoky Hill in Arkansas on the first days of August 1864, and dated the 5th at Salina, Captain Booth mentions finding a recent campsite from four to 500 Indians having a lot of stock on Big Creek. He concluded, quote unquote, I think from present indications, the Indians are upon Salina, Solomon and Republican rivers, as buffaloes are plenty upon these streams, and they depend entirely upon them for a living. His report came in written, Report of the Moffat Massacre by Captain Henry Booth, Headquarters, Salina, August 11th, 1864. Major General Blunt, who it is addressed to, Sir, I have the honor to report the following facts in regard to the killing of four men by Indians near Beaver Creek, about 40 miles from this place, on the north bank of the Salina River. Saturday evening, August 6, 1864, four men, two brothers named Moffat, one Tyler and one Houston, started from their ranch to kill buffalo for meat, taking a two-horse team with them. Upon reaching the top of a hill three-quarters of a mile from the house, the Indians were discovered rushing down upon them. The horses were turned and run down toward a ledge of rock where the men took position. They appear to have fought desperately and must have killed several Indians. Three of the men killed were scalped, but one of the scalps was left upon a rock close by. The horses were both shot through the head. This probably was done by the ranchmen to prevent them from falling into the hands of the Indians. The wagon was also burned. The Indians made a descent upon the house in which an old man and a young woman were inside. The old man shot one of the Indians through a hole in the wall whereupon they all fled. 
The number of Indians were judged to be about 100. When the messenger arrived at the place, a party of 12 citizens with Sergeant Reynolds of H Company, 7th Iowa Cavalry, proceeded to the spot. They learned about the facts. As all the ranchmen have left the country west of this point, the Indians will now be obliged to fall upon the settlements next for plunder. It seems as if they were determined to pick up all the stock possible and kill all they can overpower. The people of Salina County met in mass meeting this afternoon to devise ways and means to protect themselves and property from the ravages of the Redskins. I would state here, General, my urgent need for more cavalry horses to mount my company. I have as yet only eight government horses, the balance 30 being private. Signed, Henry Booth, Captain, Company L, 11th Kansas Volunteer Cavalry, Commanding Post. It was at this time that an elder brother, one of the elder brothers, Robert Nickel Moffat, came from Illinois to Kansas to recover the bodies of his brothers. It was September 20th, and with an escort of soldiers, headquarters at Salina, he went up the river to his brother's graves. They were disinterred from the shallow graves, the temporary graves, the remains, they were removed, and they took them to Westfield, Illinois, and that is where they rest now, in the family lot of the cemetery. Of course, the cemetery is not called that anymore. Continuing on, we are told from Illinois that a woman in the log house was the daughter of the old man, the wife of one of the men killed, and the sister of the other who, with two children, had come on a day's visit to John and Thomas Moffat. The buffalo hunt was organized partly for sport and partly for meat for the visitors. The Indians did not burn the Moffat house, nor did they steal any of the livestock which the Moffats had in their possession. Of course, probably because the old man shot at them. There are many old settlers who can remember the location of the house and stable. There are yet a few remnants left of both. The stable stood there for some time after the Moffats were killed. The buildings were rather pretentious structures for that period, and they were beyond a doubt the first permanent buildings erected by white men in Lincoln County. The banks where the battle took place are very steep in most places. They were evidently cut off by the Indians and unable to get home or into the creek, and this probably accounts for the stand which they took at the rock ledge spoken of. If they had secured this protection, they would have been saved, as I have failed to find a single instant where any whites were killed in their homes or in a well-protected river or creek. The Indians always tried to secure their victims in as easy a manner as possible, and the rock ledge where the Moffats took their last stand gave the Indians an excellent opportunity to carry out their method of warfare. It goes on to talk about the place where the four men were killed and what the conditions were found to be like after the fact. They said that the whole place was marred up badly and the victims were all buried a few yards east of where they fell. Houston and Tyler still rest there in unmarked graves and the exact spot is not known. The Moffats were removed to Illinois as previously mentioned. This was shortly after the massacre. Burial of the murdered men. Well, there was that funeral party led by the eldest brother when they found the bodies. The bodies were in a very decomposed condition as they had been exposed to the hot August sun for several days. They were all wrapped in blankets and buried in one grave side by side near the spot where they were killed and a headboard had been placed at each one. The funeral party made a little tour of inspection around the battle area. Mr. Anderson reports, there were by actual account on top of the hill west of the battlefield, the fireplaces of 15 Indian teepees that had been pitched. So there must have been at least 50 or more Indians in the bunch. 
It had been generally supposed that the Indians camped on Bullfoot Creek the night before killing the Moffats, but the camping place on top of the hill would indicate they were camped right there on the same quarter section where the battle took place. This would make it one mile or more between the Indian camp and the Moffat house, so it had been hard for the man, woman, and child in the house to escape. The funeral party found any number of marks on the sides of the rock ledges made by bullets fired by the Indians. Two of the party picked up an armful of arrows showing that the Indians were well armed with both firearms and bows and arrows. Mr. Anderson is of the opinion that this was the hardest fought battle between whites and Indians in this part of Kansas, and a good many of the Indians were certainly killed in this exchange. About two miles north from a stone ledge up the creek, a buffalo robe was found by the funeral party. This robe was, to all appearances, fixed up for carrying things from place to place, and it was bloodstained all over, certainly showing that it had been used for carrying the dead and wounded Indians from the battlefield. That would make the location of the place where it is thought the Indians buried their dead which is not far from where our present county farm is located. And that is the, the end of the testimony articles in the letter. And here we approach the grave. And what an amazing monument it is, which is held up for many decades, well over a century. Well, on the one side here, we see the inscription of the mother, probably added later when she, of course, died. And as we circle our way to the other side, we see the inscription of the two brothers, the Moffat brothers. Here below is a plaque, and I think this is the plaque that aroused Lisa's curiosity to let us know about this story. And it's good to see that is there, because aside from this YouTube recording, they will not be forgotten, and hopefully the story will not be forgotten. But here they rest. They got him back all the way to Illinois. It's kind of like Doc Holliday, his father, getting his son back to Georgia. They would ride across the country if they had to, to bring their dead home, their family. You know, as horrid and sad of a story, and a typical story that happened many times, you have to you have to wonder and just imagine the commitment, the bravery, the, that adventurous wanderlust of these young men and the families that would venture out west under such enormous risk encroaching upon the lands of the Native Americans. It has to be expected that a lot of this would happen. They were, imagine you, the Native Americans were there for tens of thousands of years, at least 10,000 years that we know of, and this was their home, and it was being invaded. What would, what would you do? Now I have to say that I find it very interesting that whenever these battles would happen, they would refer to it. If, if the Indians were massacred, they would always call it, the whites of course would always call it a battle but yet when some whites were killed, they would call it a massacre. And you see that still written today, and it's quite infuriating. If you're a Native American, I sympathize. But these things were bound to happen. This was war. Well, rest in peace to the Moffat brothers, mom, the family and hopefully they are all in a better place. I'm sure they are. Rest in peace. <laughs>